Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us on the Science of Magic, coming to you through the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. We can also be found on www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring bridging mind and soul. The human mind is an amazing thing. It's capable of storing massive amounts of information while interpreting, categorizing, and po- prioritizing data. Our minds perform complex reasoning, design and execute amazing creations, facilitate communication with others, all the while keeping our bodies running in the background as if it were an afterthought. It's no wonder we hold the mind in such high regard. Yet, in our mind-centered culture, there's been an ongoing challenge. How to transcend the mundane and access higher consciousness. We're all exposed to increasingly humdrum static from the world around us that effectively keeps us fully engaged in the low-level drama and conflict of human affairs. From the hype and hysteria of the media to the continuous barrage from tablets, computers, and cell phones, our minds are constantly bombarded with data of dubious value while the profound passes by unnoticed. This unfortunate state of affairs has us living our lives controlled by the media and common belief systems rather than having access to higher information and the concepts upon which to base our own decisions. We end up living in reaction rather than in grace. When we're living in reaction, we're easily controlled. It's as simple as providing a particular stimulus and the individual will react predictably and in accordance to their programming rather than informed and original thought. Yet the sovereignty made possible through personal access to spiritual evolution is the key to our evolution. You cannot solve a problem from the same consciousness that created it. You must learn to see the world anew. Albert Einstein If we ever hope to access the divine, we must first learn to transcend the mundane and let go of old thought forms, patterns, and beliefs. In short, see the world anew. All roads lead to Rome. There are numerous paths to spirit, yet wars have been waged over who the only way to the divine at the exclusion of all other practices. This approach is polarizing, short-sighted, and diametrically opposed to the higher frequencies found in unity, acceptance, and mutual respect. It is also a knee-jerk reaction to our conditioning and patterns. The first step in accessing spiritual information is to access our higher consciousness. This can be accomplished through many disciplines from prayer to ritual. Some methods are mind-based. Meditations calms and clears the mind, leaving it more receptive to spiritual information. Some are heart-based, setting the mind completely aside and maintaining the unifying force of neutral heart space. Others use the imagination or dream state as an access point to the soul and the higher information found through spiritual connection. One example of dream work is the age-old shamanic journey. The shamanic journey trance is much like an interactive dream, whereby the workings of spirit, or the quantum level, are represented as metaphors coming in through the imagination. In the shamanic approach, the mind is temporarily set aside. It's only after establishing connection with the esoteric function of spirit and receiving the information via the imagination is the mind engaged to interpret the metaphors, translate, and store the data. Each of us is wired in our own unique way, and how we receive spiritual information varies. Some of us are predominantly visual, some more audio, others are kinesthetic, and so on. Thus, it's very important for each of us to find a discipline or a combination of disciplines that works for us personally. The mental function is by no means the only pathway to spirit, but given the mind-centered nature of our culture, for many, it may very well be powerful and more natural avenue of exploration. One of the pioneers in methods of accessing spiritual information is our guest this hour, author, 
Colleen Morrow. A lifelong interest in the tra- untapped powers of the mind led Colleen to launch Intuition, a magazine for higher potential of the mind, in 1988. Intuition explored the higher potential of the mind and the many varied ways of knowing, intuition, inspiration, and telepathy, providing both research and how-to information for the general reader. Colleen is the author of Spiritual Telepathy, Ancient Techniques to Access Wisdom of Your Soul. Her website is www.spiritualtelepathy.net. That's www.spiritualtelepathy.net. I'll introduce Colleen and her unique approach to the subject after this short break. You are listening to The Science of Magic. This and other innovative episodes can be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Colleen Morrow, author of Spiritual Telepathy. Colleen, first I'd like to congratulate you on your book. I found it to be eloquent, succinct, and profound. Thank you. (laughs) Um, You've been in magazine publishing for 30 years. What prompted Mm -hmm. you to write a book? Well, I... um decided to end my career in magazine publishing in 2001, and I really felt like I had gone as far as I could go with my subject matter, and at that point, I started to study the Ageless Wisdom teachings, and it very quickly became apparent that there was a teaching that was really more the advanced level of what I had been doing with the magazine, and that was spiritual telepathy, and I was absolutely fascinated by the topic and spent the next several years really investigating this and figuring out how to bring it to the public because it's a very deeply esoteric teaching. Would you mind defining the term spiritual telepathy for us? Sure. Spiritual telepathy is communication from the subtle worlds, from our soul, or from higher beings. When we practice spiritual telepathy, we have the ability to be in direct communication with our souls. And communication from the subtle levels is always telepathic. We don't audibly hear the information. The information is simply dropped into our brains where it is interpreted and used. And the book provides both the theory and a step-by-step mind training practices that will allow the reader to make direct contact with the soul and through the soul to the higher worlds. And I see this as the next step, the more advanced um, form of spiritual perception and what I was doing with the magazine. Some call it the higher correspondence to our personal intuition. Our personal intuition provides guidance about our day-to-day lives, but the soul knows our higher purpose and can help us understand the bigger picture. It's our highest and purest and most reliable source of direction and guidance. When I look at it now, I can see that the magazine and and what we do with the magazine, which was to teach basic intuition practices 
and um, tell people how it can be applied in both their personal and professional lives. That was really the foundation for this more advanced work that I'm very excited about. Well, it sounds very exciting. And if there's anything we need, it's access to our spiritual information. I do have a question for you, though, Colleen. Um, if, the, if the information is just dropped into our brain, how do we know for sure where it comes from, that it is from our higher self or that it's reliable? Well, we have to just check it out with our own internal meter. I had an experience that actually led to the founding of Intuition Magazine. I was out working in my garden and between jobs and not sure what I was going to do. And this information just dropped into my brain. The words were the Center for Applied Intuition. And it was a center that I knew about, and I had met the founder, but it made no logical sense. But somehow I knew that it was important information, and I checked it out. I went over and talked to him, and as it turned out, he had a, um, a little uh, publication that he sent out to the center's members. And I had the idea to turn it into a real magazine, and everything just sort of progressed from there. So we have to just make sure that we can test it out with our own internal knowing and our, our own internal truth. It was very clear to me that it came from some higher level. So it sounds to me like you received some of your information kind of on the audio channels, right? Well, it wasn't really an audio. It was actually um, felt like it had been dropped into my brain. It was a purely mental experience. I had always accessed intuition through my emotions or some body-based sensation, but this was purely mental, dropped into my brain. The words were just there, and I knew it wasn't my thought, although I stood there stock still trying to trace back why I would have that thought, and it really made no rational sense whatsoever. It was like a foreign object. I knew it wasn't my thought, but it wasn't audible. It just was simply appeared in my brain. Okay, so it looks to me like what you're doing here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm trying to find the pathway you're using, is to, um, you'll get a, an information of some sort, whether it's audio or just a thought that comes to your brain or a sensation that comes, then you run it through the other sensory um, to double check and then check it out in ordinary reality by tracing down facts? That's right, that's right. And I actually acted on it, and that's um, something that I think is really important. I sort of sat with it for a few days, and it really felt very genuine. It felt like something I should check out, even though it didn't make any rational sense. I was looking for a magazine job, and never in a million years would I have thought to go there. But it was such a, a profound experience that I thought, well, what do I have to lose? And I called the, um, the director of this, this uh, center, and everything just progressed from there. So acting on it, really checking it out first, and then acting on it if it does feel like a, a very genuine piece of guidance. The, um, it sounds like your intent combined with the opening or possibility uh, lined up, and so it was dropped into your brain, but then it would have just sat there and done nothing if you hadn't acted on it. So basically, we can't just sit and expect things to happen. We have to take the opportunities as they present themselves. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And in the book, I talk about a mind training that allows us to make direct contact with our soul. And once we do that, we're very clear what, where the information is coming from. It's a sort of vibration or feeling, and we know when it's genuine. So what do you see as the difference between instinct, intuition, and the soul? Well, those are three types of telepathy. And it's very interesting because it illustrates our... Um, the progression of our perceptual abilities. The, the um, lowest type of telepathy is called instinctual telepathy, and we share this type of telepathy with the animal kingdom, and it's still used as a form of communication in indigenous cultures. The next form, the next higher form of telepathy is mental or mind-to-mind -mind telepathy, but there's an even higher form, which is soul, uh, soul telepathy or soul-to-soul -soul or spiritual telepathy, and that's where we are able to access very direct intuitive information. So it does show the progression of our perceptual abilities from the instinct of early man to the pure um, ra rational knowing of modern man to the pure intuitive ma knowing of future man. And we're right at that doorway now where we can take that step. These are exciting times. I, I see so many signs of this doorway, and it's, it's viewed from so many different cultures in so many different ways. Um, in, in your book, you state we're on the brink of an evolutionary leap. One is profound as our emergence from animal to human. My question is twofold. Um, do you believe humans evolve from animals? And secondly, what do you see as our next step along this evolutionary ladder? 
Well, in terms of esoteric philosophy, yeah, we did slowly evolve from animals. And um, when we make contact with the soul, it's that experience that allows us to take our first steps into the subtle worlds. And it's then that we cross the boundary between human and superhuman development. And those of us who take this step now are the pioneers who will lead our species evolution from one stage to the next. Barbara Marks Hubbard talks about this a lot. She's written that those of, on Earth, those of us on Earth today are the crossover generation responsible for leading the way from one stage of our species evolution to the next. And Eckhart Tolle talks about this too, but in more stark terms. He writes that as a species, we have the choice to evolve or die now because things are so um, crucial. They both say that evolution happens as a result of some sort of crisis that propels or forces us to make a leap forward. Toll uses the example of, a, of an amphibian who is forced to develop the ability to live on land after its habitat dries up. And our own habitat is in trouble now, and we're faced with the same need now. Our world is full of con- conflict. We have loose nukes floating around. And we need to make that next step, that leap, but not onto land, but into the subtle worlds. What do you see as the major crisis he's pushing that at this time? Global warming all the conflict in our world. We have loose nukes floating around. We have weapons that can easily extinguish the human race. So we either have to evolve or die. I believe that he's right in what he's saying. I think it's really important. So you think we're uh, standing on the crux of either uh, evolution or um, destroying ourselves and everything around us? I do. I do. I can can certainly see your concern there. You know, I think, you know, we can't look out in the world right now and not have some concern. Um, Things are looking a little grim. (laughs) But what what I like about what you're bringing is that we have the power. We are in control. We aren't just victims here. How do you see that working as uh, the numbers of us that see that actually affecting a change in the whole? Well, I think it's happening more and more. People are drawn to this. And when there's a critical mass of people making this step, then everything accelerates. People are drawn to this now as never before. And there's huge Internet networks popping up where these teachings are being disseminated all over the world. So it's a very exciting time to be alive. It is amazing, the communication that's available to us. And yet there's so much out there that's not real useful. How does a person discern one from the other? Well, you have to just check it out with your own internal meter. That's what I always say. I mean, we know. We know in some part of our bodies and some part of our souls and our hearts what's real and what's not, what's right for us and what's not. Isn't that part of our evolution, though, is coming to a place where we can access that knowing? Absolutely. Absolutely. What we did with the magazine was really reintroduce people to a way of knowing that we lost when we began to rely more on the rational mind. It was that instinctive gut feeling. And in the past, it was sort of denigrated and and talked about as women's intuition and maybe creative artists can use it, but no prominent person would admit to making a decision by anything other than rational means. And I thought it was really interesting to watch how this played out in the political world, Uh, George Bush talked about being a gut player in one of his interviews, and his homeland security person, Michael Chertoff, talked about how he had a gut feeling that we were going to be attacked. He said this in a um, press conference once, and I was really uh, excited about that. I thought, wow, this has really changed, because he, you know, he would have been sort of laughed off the stage in, in the past. But it's really become commonplace now that we have another non-rational way of knowing. Absolutely. So well put. So well put. So we're um, moving into a time, it looks like, where we're coming from the mind without the help of what the gut is sensing, moving through a time where we can incorporate what we're sensing on all the other levels, and then evolving mentally. These are indeed exciting times. It's about time we're going to have to take a break, Colleen. Um, We will be returning to our discussion after this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. If you want to hear more or other innovative episodes, can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. And we'll be returning to our riveting discussion with Colleen after this break.
The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. We can be found on www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is author and publisher Colleen Morrow. Colleen, we just started into something that really has me a little bit confused before we entered the break. And that was um, when we first were talking, you were saying how we started out as instinct and then we move, you know, a more animal-like instinct and then we move into the mental realm. And yet, when we were talking about policies and politics, you mentioned that um, what was really um, heartening was when we were able to speak from not just the mental functioning, but to blend what a gut level feeling is. Um, can you uh, clarify that a little bit for me? Sure. It's said that um, our levels of perception start with instinct, then go to rational knowing, then go to intuitive knowing. And when we begin to rely more on the rational mind, we started to discount that instinctive knowing or gut level. And again, no prominent person would ever admit that they made a decision based on anything other than rational knowing. And a really valuable part of this intuition work that we did through the 90s was helping people to reclaim that. So they understood that there's another way of knowing, a non-rational way of knowing that they have, that they can get information from and they should trust. It said that when we develop each higher form of perception, the older form doesn't disappear. It just goes below the threshold of our conscious awareness. It's still there transmitting information to us, but we don't rationally think about it. So we have reclaimed that ability to get information from non-rational sources, and now it's time to move up to the next level. And what do you see the next level as? As the soul or the pure intuitive information. I think what we did in the 90s with the intuition work was the foundation for this more advanced practice. So basically, we're coming from a mono way of looking at things, simply logic, to first a more binocular and now a multidimensional way of receiving and interpreting information? That's right. That's right. So we have sort of a a combination of um, instinct and intellect now, and we can move to that third level of perception, which is pure intuition. And yet the others remain in place so that we have the advantage of being able to run them through the litmus test. In other words, any information we get, we can run through the litmus test of looking at it logically, instinctually, and intuitively in order to discern truth. That's right. That's right. When we begin to rely more on an intuitive way of pulling in information, our rational process will still be there. It's just not something that we'll use as much. So we'll have all three. We'll have instinct, intellect, and intuition. That's, I look forward to that day, I have to tell you. (laughs) In your book, Colleen, you speak of communication from the soul, from the subtle worlds, and from higher beings. Can you explain what you mean by each and how they are alike and how they differ? Well, the soul is our own individual fragment of what's called the universal divine mind, but it's said that there are higher beings that guide the evolution of our planet, and they can't actually affect life on Earth, so they have to work through us. So they look for those people who have created a channel between the soul and the brain. Information that is sent down has to reach the brain to become part of our conscious awareness. It gets translated into words and images that we can understand. So 
we can actually be sort of the arms and legs of God, you might say, when we get information. And I think that's what happened to me through the experience I had in my garden when I was looking for a job and suddenly got the information that led to the founding of Intuition Magazine, that it was, an, it was information that was seeded. And I, and I think that more than one person gets the information. There was at least one other person who had the idea to start a magazine about intuition at the exact same time. And over the next 10 years, there was a flood of information. Many minds were seated with the same impulse. There was book after book after book. Every publisher had a book on this topic. And the magazine really provided a focal point for that. And it was a certain level of um, knowing and a certain level of teaching that was really important for that time. But I think we can take the next step now. I had a, a, a conversation with an astrologer, actually, not too long ago, and he spoke about how, well, once um, Pluto came, be, was discovered, then it started affecting the masses. And I said, but wait, Pluto was there whether it was discovered or not. He said, yes, but in order for it to interact with the humans, it had to be it delivered into the human consciousness. Is it like that? Mm-hmm. A- absolutely. So, so that hundred monkey theory, each of us holding a, a truth of consciousness that has heretofore not been part of the group consciousness can affect a change in the whole. That's right. If you imagine that we're all cells in the body of God, if one cell lights up, then it creates a magnetic pull that makes it easier for other cells to light up. And the more that do, the stronger the magnetism and the easier it, still it is for other people to come up to that level. So we're all doing this not for ourselves, but for the greater good and for the group, the soul of humanity. So those of us that choose to participate are opening ourselves to this higher information, if you will, and then it's kind of dropped to us when we're available and it enters into the consciousness of mankind? Yes, and we can actually train ourselves so that we can access that information at will, and that's really the the basics of what this book is. It does happen, happen spontaneously, like it happened to me in my garden. But it is possible to, to train ourselves through a mind training practice so that we have access to the higher worlds at will. And it happens through the practice of creative meditation. Many meditation practices focus only on quieting the mind. In this type of meditation, we actually go a step further, and we actively train the mind to transmit information from the soul to the brain. And again, the information has to reach the brain to become part of our conscious awareness. In the same way that our homes are wired for telephone and Internet connection, this type of meditation allows us to create the threads and cables that link us to the higher worlds. And we create these cables by projecting our attention upward to the soul day after day, And we visualize the soul as a star about six inches above our head. And each time we do this, we anchor small threads of energy that eventually, thread by thread, form a bridge between the mind, the brain, and the soul. The bridge is called the Rainbow Bridge or the Bridge of Light in the Wisdom Teachings. It's called the Antakarana in the Hindu text, and it's called the Straight or Narrow Gate in the New Testament. What I discovered through researching this topic is that this same teaching appears in all of our spiritual traditions. It really is the core teaching, a universal teaching that exists across traditions and cultures. I love it when it comes together because ultimately it's in the unity of all these that we find truth. Don't you believe? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you differentiate between the mind and the brain. Can, Can you help us understand the difference? Sure, there's been a lot of scientific research on this. The brain is actually local, encased within our skulls. It's individual. The mind is non-local, not encased in our skulls. It's part of a a group mind or a universal mind. Oh, so you see the mind as the organism that we create when we come together as humans? Yes. And again, our soul is sort of a, um, you might say, an individual fragment of the divine mind. Larry Dossie talks about this a lot, and he's done a lot of research on this. It was first talked about in the 50s by Schrodinger, who wrote a book called Mind and Matter. And he was the first person to talk about the mind as non-local, and that's become um, a subject of scientific discovery and experiments that have been really exciting. Mm. Wow. You, you reference many traditions in your book, such as Christianity, Buddhism, Egyptian practices. What practices did, did you draw on predominantly for the uh, form of meditation you teach in your book? Well, this is a pretty universal 
teaching, it actually is based on um, very ancient practice of Raja Yoga. And this was a teaching that was um, taught in the ancient mystery schools, and it was first put into book form by Patanjali. And he taught what he called Raja Yoga. And his dates are unknown. Most Western authorities think he lived about 300 years before Christ. The Hindus go back even further. They think he lived 10,000 years before Christ. And so this was the first time that this knowledge was actually in printed form. That's fascinating. So you're, you're bringing it in printed form and kind of combining it all together. It's about that time. We're going to have to take another break, Colleen. I want to pick up where we left off on the other side of this short break. We'll be back on the flip side of this break. You are listening to The Science of Magic. Our theme song, One People, One Nation, is from the Winds of Time album by my musical group, Starfire, and can be found on iTunes.com, CDBaby.com, Amazon.com, and my website, GwildaWiyaka.com. We'll be right back. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State Certified Occupational School, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. We can be found on www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Again, our guest this hour is author and publisher Colleen Morrow. Colleen, we were talking about the different traditions that went into the writing of your book. Do you mind telling us a little more about that? No. uh, Before I started the book, I thought very carefully about how I wanted to frame this information because it's so esoteric, and I wanted to broaden the audience and make this accessible to an audience far beyond those that read, usually read esoteric books. And so I did one of two things. I started to study all different traditions, and I found that the same teaching exists in all. So I, I framed it as a universal teaching and showed people in one chapter how the teachings expressed in both Eastern and Western traditions. I also showed that our quantum scientists are, are coming to the same conclusions about how we're all interrelated and so on. So those two things, I thought, made it more credible to an audience beyond the people that already believe in esotericism. That's wonderful, because this is, uh, I found your book um, evolutionary and revolutionary. It was, and so beautifully written and easy to understand. So you, as far as I'm concerned, managed to accomplish just exactly that. Um, as as one engages in your mind training practice in order to raise the frequency of the mind and the brain to that of the soul, do you find a certain amount of processing is involved? Absolutely, and this is really important. This is considered the first step, and it's called the refinement stage where we refine our physical, emotional, and mental bodies. And it's important because we have to create a direct line, a direct, clear line of communication between the soul, the mind, and the brain. 
And to do this, we need to purify the body. We need to quiet our minds and emotions. If we have an illness, if we're tired, if we have mental or emotional static, especially, it makes it hard for our brains to register higher wisdom and ideas. And refinement practices, too, are part of all of our spiritual traditions, and the methods vary from tradition to tradition, but the requirements and goals are exactly the same. Purity of body, control of the emotions, and stability of mind. And in the book, I included the refinement practices that have helped me the most. I had a hard time with this, because when I got really serious about quieting myself down, what I discovered is that I had a lot of unresolved emotional stuff that came bubbling up. And the quieter we become, the more in touch we get with that. Some of it was really old, people that I needed to forgive. And it really interferes with our ability to receive. So I actually decided I needed some help with this, and I worked with a really wonderful spiritual healer named Stephen Lumiere. And his prescriptions, so to speak, were three meditations that he asked me to do morning, noon, and night. One was on forgiveness, one was on loving kindness, and one was on compassion. So I did those three meditations day after day after day for an extended period, and it really helped. It really started quieting my emotional body down. And it was at that point that I really started to be able to do this more seriously. Jack Kornfield talks about this, too. He says that when he started to teach meditation, he discovered that at least half of his students were unable to master basic concentration exercises because they had so much unresolved emotional stuff that came bubbling up in just the same way it did for me. And so he's been a real pioneer in bringing Western therapeutic practices into Eastern contemplative practices so people can quiet down. That really is a necessary first step. So what tools do you offer in your book to uh, support this process? Well, I actually have um, 12 meditations in the book. Three are progressive mind training meditations, and the others are refinement practices. uh, Again, I had loving kindness, forgiveness, compassion, altruistic joy, ways of just shifting the emotional body and upgrading um, physically by eating right and getting enough sleep. And again, there's no um, one-size-fits-all. It's just what is appropriate for us. And also training the mind, quieting the emotional body and mental body. Usually meditation practices focus on the mind, but when we work from the bottom up, it's actually easier when we quiet ourselves down emotionally, it's easier to quiet the mind. You know, what I've, what I've found in my shamanic practice, which is just another avenue to the same place, I think, is that it's almost like this uh, spiraling. In other words, you work at one level, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and then you hop up a rung, and then you process out the next level, and so on. Is that what you've experienced? Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't really get anywhere until I quieted my emotional body. And I was surprised at how much I had to do because I had done a lot of therapeutic work in the past. But the, as I said, the quieter I got, the more in touch I got with old stuff, people that I hadn't forgiven and that I really needed to do that clearing. And it really made a difference. That's, that's, that's profound. Um, so what are the mystery schools and how do you use them in developing this practice? Well, the mystery schools, there's some contemporary mystery schools, but in ancient times, the mystery schools were training people to do exactly uh, what's in the book. And it was considered a secret teaching, something that you had to be ready for, and um, only some people were allowed. And now it's really um, up to us. It's more of a um, practice that any of us can do if we're willing to do the daily discipline, because that's what's so important. If we want to build this bridge, we have to do it day after day because it's an energetic bridge that starts to dissipate if we slack off. And I've had as much trouble with this as anybody. And I talk about that in the book about how it was difficult for me to maintain this discipline too and you know how I figured out a way that worked for me. But we do have to do it every day. And if we don't, we, it's almost like we have to start over. Colleen, where can people find your book? It's on Amazon. It's on all the online venues. It's in some bookstores. And your website? Do you you sell it through your website? Sure. Well, no, I have links to Amazon and actually to all the online venues. And there's also an an excerpt. If people want to read the introduction to the book, it's there. I also have issues of Intuition Magazine. And, oh, the Intuition Magazine can be accessed through your website as well? Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
and that would be www.spiritualtelepathy.net to access Colleen's book, her link to Amazon, as well as the publication um, that she did with her magazine. This, this is really fun. Colleen, do you have a message uh, for your listeners at this point? Sure. This, uh, this is something that anyone can do. I've really been always very touched when I read about people who have the ability to communicate with the higher worlds. Joan of Arc, for example, talked to saints and angels. Eileen Caddy received guidance that led to the founding of the Finhorn community in Scotland. And George Washington Carver walked in the woods each morning to talk to God. And it's always stirred a longing in me, and I've always wondered, why does this happen only to some people? Are they special or more evolved than the rest of us? And what I discovered by immersing myself in this topic is that with proper training, we can all cultivate this ability. And it's so essential right now that we access the soul and really see that we're part of a group soul and that everything's interconnected and we work for the greater good. It's a big shift personally. And when we do it collectively, we can change the world. And that's, you, know, you made a point that I think is so important, that if you don't make a daily practice out of this, it dissipates and you end up sinking by your own weight and losing connection with the whole. Is that the way you see it? I do, and, and I really had a tough time with this because the best time to meditate is first thing in the morning, and I'm not a morning person. I like to wake up really slowly and give myself time, and for most of my adult life, I was involved in magazine publishing and always on deadline, and I had to hit the ground running as soon as the alarm went off, and when I worked on this book, I finally had an extended period where I could honor my own rhythms, and I didn't want to jump out of bed and start training my mind. I wanted to enjoy my morning, so I tried all different things. What I discovered is if I took time in the morning, I, it was too late by the time I got around to meditating because my mind was already too engaged in the day. So I give myself 20 minutes or so to wake up, and then I do it. Colleen, it has been an absolute blessing to have you on the show. This has been The Science of Magic. I'm your host, Wilda Wiecka. Remember, you can always listen to this and other provoking episodes on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones. May you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love.